everyone, I'm Dr. Michelle Wong. Welcome to the second annual Sunscreen eSummit. I'm talking about science communication in sun care and beauty in general, why it's important and how we can boost it. Since this is a sun care SciComm event, hopefully it won't be too hard to convince you about the why. A bit about me, my formal education is in chemistry, my professional background is science education. I'm the founder of Lab Muffin Beauty Science, where I explain the science behind cosmetics for a general audience, and a lot of the time this means sunscreen. I've been making content for about 11 and a half years, mostly on my website, Instagram, and YouTube. So my area of expertise is translating complex science into something that's engaging and understandable, but still acceptably accurate. Last year, I talked about where sunscreen myths come from, how to effectively bust them, and why we should care. This year, I wanted to zoom out a little. Since last year, I've been talking to a lot of science communicators outside of beauty, and that's made me reflect on the similarities and differences between beauty psychom and other topics, some of the unique challenges, but also opportunities that I think we have. So I'm going to be talking about why we should talk to consumers about science, why there isn't more good science content, and what we can do to increase it. So first off, do consumers even need to know the science? Traditionally, most of the industry has thought it's not necessary, you just need to get people to buy your products, they don't need to know the details behind how the product works, it'll just overwhelm them and you can't fit that much in an ad. So just play to what consumers already know and feel and sell them the dream where things like testimonials and celebrity endorsements. Maybe some indications that there's science behind the product like ask your doctor and some ingredient names. Now this worked really well for a long time and it still works really well, like perfumes just sell pretty much on Vyz, but then the internet happened and social media and smartphones. So from the invention of the printing press until around 2004, media was very one way. There was a high barrier to entry to have a platform which was both good and bad. There were gatekeepers, everyone was getting pretty much the same message through magazines and TV, and that message was tailored for a general audience. Then the floodgates opened around 2004, starting with Facebook. Suddenly there was a very low barrier to entry. So on the good side, there was a lot more diversity in the forms of media and information available, and algorithms tend to give people information that's relevant to them. But this also came with a few really big problems. First off, there has been this explosion in the volume of information available. People are spending more and more time on the internet, and every website and platform wants people to stay up and watch their ads, which is their main source of income. So there is a lot of incentive to make content and to get people to make content for them. So there were 95 million Instagram uploads every day in 2019. Over 1 billion hours of YouTube videos were watched every day in 2021. And the total amount of digital data grew 10 times from 2013 to 2020 to 44 million million gigabytes. So these days, if people are asking what is vitamin E, for example, it is really easy to look up an answer. And there will be answers. Not necessarily the right answers, but they will exist. And this information landscape has evolved so quickly, people haven't really developed the tools to work out what is and isn't correct. Those source evaluation skills that a lot of us were taught in school are really outdated. So if the science isn't there or it's being drowned out, then consumers are just going to believe what they can find. And if people see something more often, they're more likely to believe it's true, even if they know it's false. This is called the illusory truth effect, and it is partly based on logic because this new information aligns with what I already know, but it is also just familiarity. It is how our flawed human brains work. The feelings of familiarity in our brain overlap with the feeling of truth. So if misinformation isn't challenged and people keep seeing it, it will stick. And this also leads to pseudoscience in the sense of alternative science, like a different system for explaining what is happening. So I showed this myth family tree last year. Many consumers are smart and curious about things that affect them, the products they're using. They will draw connections and apply what they've learned to new situations. So if there's misinformation and is 
isn't dealt with for too long, then it has babies and then those babies have babies. And then so dealing with all of this new stuff becomes harder and harder. Another example of alternative science is clean beauty scores. So sites like the EWG have made up their own systems to turn studies into scores for ingredients, and then those become scores for products somehow. It is mostly based on vibes. I think it is really well summed up in this quote from a paper critiquing a similar system that they have for food. The methodology used to create the Dirty Dozen list does not appear to follow any established scientific procedures. There are a lot of internal inconsistencies because the system doesn't reflect reality, like they have always said that oxybenzone is the worst sunscreen ingredient, but according to their scores, it doesn't actually seem to be the worst anymore. But a lot of consumers will believe all of this because for the longest time, you just couldn't find easy to understand information explaining how the toxicology of cosmetic products work. So now instead of debunking just one fact like oxybenzone is dangerous, you have to explain away a whole system of thought. And this is a huge problem because consumer sentiment has a massive influence on our products and regulations. So the cosmetic industry ends up on a constant treadmill of making products to solve non-existent problems and often this creates new problems. So we've seen this with preservatives where there's been regrettable substitution with increasing allergies as new preservatives have replaced parabens. Smaller brands are making products without preservatives because they don't know the science, which leads to mold. And the list of preservatives that consumers don't hate are getting smaller and smaller because that is where this whole scientific, pseudoscientific system ends up. And while in the short term, lots of companies might be able to take advantage of these trends to sell more products, it usually means that in the long run, dishonest actors get an unfair competitive advantage. We are also seeing it with sunscreen. So this is just one example. There was this widely publicized unreplicated study with lots of methodological issues about these two chemical sunscreens, bleaching coral. Even though there was existing evidence that mineral sunscreens could potentially be more harmful than lots of chemical sunscreens, this misinformation wasn't tackled early and effectively, and it's now grown into all chemical sunscreens being banned in Maui County, it might expand to all of Hawaii, possibly further. ReefSafe has been acclaimed for a while now, and now we're seeing Hawaii compliant, which will also go towards reinforcing this myth that these ingredients are so bad the government banned them. And this obviously has implications for people getting skin cancer. Mineral sunscreens are just not a good option for many people. And it contributes towards this wider idea that the industry makes dangerous products, which again leads to this treadmill and a wider distrust of science in general. So here is Michelle's grand unified beauty misinformation feedback loop. Bad information is teaching consumers to demand bad products and marketing and bad legislation. The bad products of marketing and legislation are reinforcing and adding legitimacy to the bad information in consumers' minds. And then consumers seek out and share more bad information, and consumers also become content creators who make more bad information. So I guess the question is, why isn't there as much good information? Well, the first issue is just that accurate content takes longer to make. So you might have heard of Brandolini's law, which is the amount of energy needed to refute BS is an order of magnitude bigger than that needed to produce it. And that's because research takes time and effort and skills, but making stuff up doesn't. So it takes me about 20 hours to make a YouTube video when I'm not already familiar with the topic. This is 20 more hours in addition to all the editing and all of that. So that means a lot more misinformed content can get made in the same amount of time. On top of that, misinformation is just appealing. Platforms are fighting for people's eyeballs. Algorithms push content that gets engagement, which is things like likes and shares, because it gets people onto their platform and keeps them there. And that tends to be stuff that's easy to understand, takes less time to explain, makes people feel strong emotions. And you can just make up misinformation to tick these boxes. So it is inherently going to get shared more and there is more incentive to make this sort of content. So for example, when a scary sunscreen story comes out, there is a flood of clickbait articles and posts. And then to compound this situation further, there are just less people who have the knowledge and skills to make accurate beauty science content. 
The people best equipped to give accurate information might be scientists or dermatologists or people who are just really good at finding info. They often have jobs already because these skills are in demand, so they have limited time. If they're working in the cosmetic industry, then they might not be allowed on social media, and people might not trust them because of that perceived conflict of interest. Science content creation is also a specialized skill. You need to know the science, which can be difficult because for cosmetics, so much of it isn't publicly available, which is partly why the summit exists. You need to also know how to write persuasively, edit videos and plaid podcasts. You need to know the best practices for using each social media platform, promote your content and optimize your website, have marketing and business skills. People with potential will generally be good at some of this already. But building this skill set, fleshing it out, and keeping it up to date takes a lot of time and practice. And there is a really high rate of burnout and attrition with beauty science content creators. It can be really rewarding, but you are often challenging people's deep seated beliefs. There can be a lot of hate comments. Because of all these extra demands, it often feels like you are working so much harder for much less recognition. And good science communication often looks easy and obvious, so it ends up being underappreciated even by other scientists. And people will plagiarize you in subtle and not so subtle ways, which just adds to this feeling of, why am I even doing this? Because you are probably doing it unpaid for a long time, unless you are very lucky. I was losing money on Lab Muffin for six years on top of all the hours I sank into it. So it is difficult to persuade talented people to go into beauty cyclone and just keep doing it. I've seen so many great beauty science content creators struggle to do it sustainably, and then one day they decide it's not worth it and quit, which just means that all those acquired skills are just gone. And this is especially bad for beauty, I think, because it is such a gendered topic. So for this section, I'm going to be talking about gender in a very binary way, unfortunately, because that is how the data is being collected, which is an issue. The beauty audience is roughly 90% women, so we might expect a similar split for beauty science content creators. Despite the lower barrier to entry and the greater diversity, gender representation is still a huge issue with online science content, particularly at the top end. So out of the top 150 science and tech YouTube channels, only eight are hosted by women, two don't show their faces, and one of the ones that does is animated. And this representation is actually worse with free market science communicators than with traditionally produced videos. If you talk to female science communicators, everyone points to discrimination and lack of support. This study categorized 23,000 comments on science videos and they found that women get more than twice as many negative comments and lots of comments that aren't even about the content. It's about how they look or they're just sexual or hostile. Studies have repeatedly shown that people tend to believe men are inherently better at science than women. So for example, people constantly ask less qualified men to fact check women. It feels like being male often acts like an additional qualification. And if this was just once a week, it would probably be fine, but it is constant. Almost a decade ago, Emily Grassley linked this to why there's far fewer female science YouTubers. In general, women don't have enough time to make science videos because of the pressure that every episode has to be flawless in execution. There's a pressure to be the whole package. Not only do you have to be intelligent and articulate, but you also have to be attractive. So there is a greater time commitment for women, as well as extra time wallowing in self-criticism from the negative comments about the science. We also have to spend extra time on our appearance when a lot of men can get away with just picking up a camera and filming. And of course, there are other barriers in representation that have a compounding effect like ethnicity, class, sexual orientation, physical ability. So obviously this has been pretty depressing. But after a lot of wallowing, I realized there are actually a lot of unique opportunities for SciComm in personal care online. Firstly, there are advantages to beauty being so feminine. Female hosted channels seem to get more engagement, more likes, comments, and subscribers per view than male hosted or faceless channels. It could be partly because people tend to connect more with women on screen. Traits like caring are associated with women, so stereotypes might have a tiny upside. And the beauty audience is very female. These gender biases are still at play, but it is less. 
So beauty is relatively insulated from some of the nastier comments. Anecdotally, female side comments have said they get much higher quality comments when they talk about a topic that attracts more women. So there is the potential for beauty psychom to lead the field for representation. Women also seem to seek out science content for information purposes more, so this is a huge advantage for personal care and sun care that we have over more abstract science topics. So for example, I made this video two years ago about whether you need to wear sunscreen indoors. There is a lot of technical detail about using Skyview to estimate UV, and it's getting towards half a million views. There is a graph in the thumbnail, people hate graphs. I decided to really try pushing it in um, this next video where I talk about how sunscreens work, things like electron excitation and relaxation. 40,000 people decided to watch physical chemistry in their spare time and not just to prepare for an exam. This is really impressive. Another example, these are the top two skincare products at one of the biggest pharmacy chains in Australia. They have super technical names on identical looking bottles. These would not be selling this well 20 years ago. So I think this should be really encouraging for people who want to do beauty psychom and also for brands whose products are based on solid science, but they might need a bit more explanation. Now, how can brands participate in and support psychom? Obviously, you can incorporate it in your marketing, share data about your product, explain how it works. If you're not confident with that, you can hire science communicators. But a lot of brands have told me that they don't feel like consumers necessarily trust them when they do Psycom, particularly when it's debunking misinformation relevant to their products. And that's a problem because myth busting is such an important area of Psycom for beauty. There is a bit of an attitude of, of course, that's what you would say to sell more products and smear your competitors. Another option is sponsorships with independent science creators. Sponsored posts typically appear on their platform. The creator has established credibility and a relationship with their audience. They also know how best to tailor the content. I've done a lot of these. It is one of my main income sources. You do need to disclose the conflict of interest and some people are naturally a bit suspicious, but beauty is actually one of the more mature areas for influencer partnerships. Beauty consumers are a lot more receptive than in a lot of other areas of science. Many see it as beauty brands supporting science. Plus, with scientific content, you can present data and verifiable information, which helps it look less biased. A new option that I hope will be part of the solution is Beauty Psycom Group. This is an organization I started with Jen of the EcoWell to increase the quality, volume, and reach of accurate beauty science content. We've been doing Beauty Psycom online for a combined 18 years, and based on our experiences, we have a bunch of ideas that we think could really help, but it is more than we could do on our own. So some of these ideas are free education programs for beauty psychomers to help them develop their skills faster, make better content, get it to reach more people, and hopefully make it more sustainable for more psychomers to do more Beauty Psycom for longer. We're also going to have beauty science resources to make it easier for less technical content creators and journalists to find accurate information. There's also a media center that will have press releases and relevant experts for breaking news stories to try to tackle myths early. So if you're interested in finding out more about us or supporting us, we're at beautypsycom.com. You can also follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn. So I really believe that this misinformation feedback loop can also work to make an ecosystem for good information and products and regulations as well. So hopefully I've given you some insights today into why Psycom is so important in sun care and beauty and some ideas about how we might be able to shift the balance and push our industry in a better direction.